the second uh, reading of our reading series this semester. We have two very good poets with us today who will be sharing their work of poetry and prose, um, talking a bit about their process and their work. Um, we'll each give them, uh, they will each have 20 minutes to share their work, and maybe the, the last 15 or so minutes there will be a question and answer in case the audience wants to ask questions. Um, maybe just a few reminders if you have already, if you have not yet signed up for the raffle, um, please make sure you put your name with Keith. So up for grabs tonight is each of these authors' books. Um, and we have a special raffle for Bring a Friend. So if you have brought a friend, that has never been to a writer's center reading, uh, make sure Keith knows that, because then, so make sure your names are with Keith at the back, because that allows you a chance to win one of these very hard to get shirts from the writer's center. <laughs> um, so make sure you give up your name. Yeah. Um, okay, our first reader for tonight is Grace Chia. Uh, she's published several books, including a novel, The Wanderlusters, a short story collection, Every Moving Thing That Lives Shall Be Food, poetry collections, Wu Man Go and Cordelia, and a chapbook, The Cuckoo Conundrum. She's also edited the prose anthology, We Are Family. In 2017, Grace Chia was the writer in residence for the Toji Cultural Foundation in Korea, and the Macau Literary Festival in conjunction with the University of Macau. She was also the first national NACMPU writer in residence from 2011 to 2012. Um, I am personally very excited to have Grace with us here tonight. And, um, yeah, let's welcome Grace. I just throw my voice because I don't have a mic. The last person can hear me, right? Um, I, okay, I, I brought a few books, um, and this will be the one for the raffle. Uh, that's the short story collection. Um, and this is my debut novel called Wonder Losses. Um, both these books came out uh, last year uh, during the Writers' Festival. And I'll be reading something from the short story collection because um, it was easier to read from the short excerpt than the novel. And um, I'll be reading a few poems from my uh, poetry collection called Cordelia. And I'm also coming out with a new book uh, this year, so I'm very happy. I like it. Okay, um, yeah, uh, a few things about me, I guess, just to introduce myself. Um, I started writing uh, poetry many years ago. <laughs> and um, my first published book was poetry. So I've been writing poetry for a very long time. Um, and then I got into prose, um, not that I got into prose late, I think, I, I, I assume that a lot of you are writers here, and you know, as you dabble with composition writing in schools and stuff, um, you try to find a genre that you're comfortable with, and poetry seemed to be a very good fit for me because it was very short, and it was very intense, and I liked to capture short, intense moments into a poem, and um, I, I sort of then found my love into prose um, recently uh, when I had more things to say, more scope to expand my narrative. And so then I started writing um, a novel first. I found that I got stuck. So if any of you have problems writing novels and you're stuck, it's very normal. Then I got into writing short stories because I asked um, uh, certain writers um, what, you know, how I should go about doing uh, novels and, and basically the advice was try short stories, so I did, so that's how it came about. So, um, I'm going to start by reading a poem and then I'm going to read prose and then maybe a poem and then prose a poem. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to ask somebody to help me with reading a um, very short piece of dialogue. Can you help me? So, anyway, yeah, so maybe at some point I can kill you, but. Um, so the highlighted ones. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. But it will only when it gets there. Okay. So I'm gonna start by reading a poem, and it's called Goya. Under the influence of a 1998 Shiraz, Saturn 
too. If you know the, the painting by Goya, Saturn, yeah? So you know when, um, yeah, Saturn was eating his children, the very grotesque thing. So I, it's my reinterpretation. Last night, furiously, I downed a chalice of my own blood and grew heathen, hulk like rampaging through the radioactive streets of a, of a mental spell under siege, uprooted some forests, drained the lagoons, then taunted the volcanoes to boil over. They did. The planets realigned, the moon played hopscotch with his sister's sun, while the dinos roared for the last time, then slept soundly, bone naked on a soft mound. Earth skated around the ring many times, while hapless Mars held on for the ride. Mammals on fours stood up to walk on tools. Metal made blades was found to be useful. Tools caught food, raped, then made food, prostitutes for power. Politics bounced off the walls from meatballs to basketballs as mongers of jackals scavenged the remains of leftover suppers. Through all this, I peeled my ears to the ground, waiting for a thunderous walk waiting for Colossus to mesh my brains. It didn't. In one drop of a crystalline tear, the labyrinthine stew of my brains was ravaged, swallowed, whole. The alcohol for coherence itself, my senses plummet and plunder. Starved, I gouge out angels, pop an eye, then devour my organs. Next, I am going to read um, a short excerpt from a short story called Galaxies. So it's about um, worlds colliding. Uh, I have a galaxy phone and you have iPhone or galaxies combined. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the narrator is unnamed and um, she's responding to um, a person whom I shall only call him A. Uh, He's like an abbreviated person. So, um, ah, he was right about our systems not matching. About being from a different galaxy. A man living in the open yet hidden under the floorboards. So much falsity the entire time we were together. It was an adventure. A boy and a girl playing pirates and gypsies. We wanted to see who would walk the plank, jump off the ship, test the fool's courage. The game was romance. He was a gamer. I tried to outgame him. Thing was, he was skilled in the espionage of manipulation. It was subtlety he had always been using as a bait. I stood no chance. When I slapped him, it was all over. He didn't mind the slap. I had never done it before in my life. Never had violence been a part of my physical makeup except that day when he was grinding his groin on the dance floor of a hussy he had just picked up in my absence. It was all over for me, watching him as he bent his knees to her knees, legs arched, their groins rubbing against each other, the music too fast a rhythm for the movement, my head about to explode, bad trouble surging bloodlust to each cell in my cerebrum, my teeth hungry for revenge. He didn't see me, didn't know I would be there. He was baiting for a fresh catch. I was spying on him. Sure enough, I caught a would-be spy in the heat of a lombada, aiming his genitals at a few at a new female host. I had never felt more dead and alive at the same time. I went up to them, two dancing spiders in a copulating frenzy. I pulled the hair of a woman. She screeched. I pulled it so hard I peeled her body away from her mates. They disentangled. The disco strobe lights rained down on me. I looked cut up, poker dotted, alien. In the dark, my white blouse was luminescent. My eye whites and narrow teeth glowed. What the? The woman yelled, though her words were interrupted by my mind. Shut up, skank! Who the? The woman lunged at me and my words drowned hers, for I was stirred by the kind of hunger her shallow protestation stood no chance. Get out of my face! Excuse me, are you insane? The woman continued, but someone had pulled her away. It was a female friend who had seen that I was about to start war, saving her. 
I was with you only last night. I turned to R and hollered with a surging rage like a beastly alien tearing me from within. Mind you, I was half his size. R didn't immediately recognize me. I had turned into an alien, ravenous, murderous, grotesque in every ugly sense. When passion takes over, consciousness is led to the slaughter. I was still bent on his knees in a short interview of my dramatic hair pulling of his dance partner. The music was feverish, pumping shots of metallic snares my sharp ears had now picked up. Some bad vocalist was howling like a wolf. Sampled melodies of tribal chants and the great bits of DJ shadow filtered through the chorus. I looked around me, saw predatory gleaming eyes encircling me. My heart went inside my eardrum telling me to slow down, slow down, calm down, calm down. Then he saw me. His face could not lie. I caught a glimpse of regret and compassion before I set my hand flying to his cheek. It was a great force. For someone much smaller and slender with hands that had never been calloused by labor, the slapping of R was a phenomenal event. The palm of my hand hit his cheek. His flesh wobbled. The meeting of our skins burned like hot stones. His jaw bone hard against the bones of my right hand, yet his face turned to the motion of my wrist, my arm, my shoulder, my torso, my posterior and spine that supported the entirety of my upper body. His head turned against his wheel sideways and then to the back, forcing him to face the opposite side where he had been. I'm very sorry. R said when he recovered, looking at me with sadness. Everything inside me that had pretended the fling was a lie had come to a catharsis with one slap. Everything evaporated. He was, and probably wasn't, a spy. He did, and probably never did, find me special. Nothing mattered. Chemistry between two rotating, diverging galaxies strong enough to pull them together was not rational enough a cause for the devastating effect of heartbreak. He hadn't felt it, I told myself again and again. My passion had exposed me. He felt it, he knew it, he regretted it. It was in his eyes and the warmth of his arms as he tried awkwardly to hold on to me, this black widow, despite my assault, a plea for me to eat him alive. Okay, a uh, one more short one. It's called um, Far Gone. Far Gone. Your presence, kryptonite. I grovel, weak knee, eating earth, shattered. Thoughts, frosted to icicles. An igloo, I am, stoked by flames within the cavern. Between barred walls of my ribs, inside, a ball of blood threatens to erupt. Secrets of skeleton, in whispers, ghost words wrapped as candied curses. Every sentence you speak is a phonesia. A charmed scorpion, unstirred. I am fleeing through curtains and curtains of silken lies, a masquerade covered. I, exiled from myself, stuck in an outer universe, unmapped, unable to return, unhinged, a helium caricature, ungrounded, going up, up, and away into the oblivion of a loopy, speechless echo. was something that could be produced to create political meaning and agency. 
space. I was trapped in a room in a university on an island where space was condensed to the monotony of motions. Space was used for utilitarian purpose. Why is that tripping me? I don't know why. Space in my world was the opposite of the space of infinity, of outer space, of black holes, worlds, and multiple galaxies. I knew only my cage and its metallic bars. I needed a projection, something beyond the present, beyond the lack of climatic seasons, the machinery of theorems and tests, beyond the train rides that turned me into one robot out of a hundred robots in a capsule shuttling from one platform to another. I shut her voice out. My mind became still, peaceful, an image floated out of this serenity. Ice blue. Ice blue is a German word for ice flower, for this um, snowflake that looks like a flower. I smiled, took out my smartphone, and started texting. Hey, Peter, how's the vacation so far? Are you missing Singapore? Singapore misses you. I paused as long as my courage could endure. I heard my professor's voice in the distance. I channeled her out again and returned to my phone, typing the rest of the message. Pity we didn't have more time to hang out. Right then when you can. I heard the rain pelting on the roof. The cold room started becoming unbearable. Goosebumps pimpled my arms. Be bold. Be honest, I told myself. I signed off the message. I miss you. The pressed scent. I froze. Did I just externalize my thought? Could I delete it? No, he couldn't. Did I just put myself out there? crystallized an idea that had been floating around formless in the air. I blushed and giggled softly. Outside, the wind whistled aloud. Foo, foo, I thought it, I heard it say. I took Peter's picture of the ice room and made it my screensaver. Something blossomed inside me. I listened to the professor and smiled to everything she said. The rain droned on to an acoustic murmur, a symphony amplifying the sounds of nature drowning the mechanical words of theory, intellect, skepticism, and criticism, ways to prove what exists with the whys and how-tos. The lecturer repeated, if you don't have enough points to substantiate the thesis statement, your argument isn't going to be very solid. In my private memory, I rewound the scenes of the past, the private moments I had shared with Peter. I relished the jokes he made, even the awful ones that were meant to be humorous but turned out flat like roadkill. The more I reminiscized, the more I turned Peter into something endearing. Maybe, just maybe, I had been focusing on the wrong side of him. I needed to examine him on the flip side, notch up more points to make Peter a convincing argument. What for? For the funny way he makes me feel, for the wistful way his face crops up in flashback, and I don't know why or how it happened. The rain seemed to have stopped. Someone opened the door to use the bathroom, and the sounds of laughter from the corridor spilled into our room. A giggle came from the back of the, of the class. It sounded like a girl flirting with the happiest guy from the class who played rugby, water polo, and tennis. The job who couldn't be ignored. He who had no fear of poems about the limitation of spaces. All spaces, big and small, were conquerable to him. If the world were the Bermuda Triangle, he was enthroned in the middle of it. From the way he looked smartly at me, I was to him most definitely a square, like many others in his peripheral vision. Some spaces, even within the same plot, would never overlap, never connect. Sometimes, it took imagination to leap out the ordinary, to muse over shapes and spaces you couldn't quite grasp with yet. These were unknown territories, unfittable puzzles, seasonal eccentricities. The lecturer finally cracked a joke, a dry, lame, witty joke about I don't know what, and three people laughed. My phone beat with a new message. It was Peter. There were only two words. It read, me too. 
got just enough time for one last word. And it's called um, Made in Singapore, I Cordelia. Was it your pride, Father, that kept you spitting up reams of a gilded river, lavished on the shallow utterances of daughters who love you least? If the myth were true, imagine. We, as spawn of the grotesque, sprouts of the beasts fecund underbelly, legions of unceasing worker ants, a seminal mess of a mercenary mess, we claim this dot now, hence, hereafter. This is our lot, our blotch, our orgiastic spot. I will root for you, dear, when in years you age, sputtering still, nonsensical diatribes of how best to run the house in order. I will weep for you, your majesty, reminded of how your humble hubris of your limited vision blinded you to the loyalty of a uterine unit. Be proud, Father, be very proud of your homemade hybrids, your pure lily white curdled cubes of robotistic square thoughts. You made us machines, plucked us to the wrath of the lightning gods. In this debris of consumerist molehill trash, I will search for a soul somewhere and fish for the skeletal remains of a barely recognizable and devious feline. The legend that branded me my anthropomorphic marquee name. prizes from the Don Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards. Um, he just received another one last week? Uh, no, yesterday? Uh, yesterday. Um, uh, he's won it twice. Uh, that's one of the biggest awards in the Philippines. Uh, he's also received awards from the Coco Guevara Poetry Competition, British Council, Meritage Press, among others. His first full-length collection, Aria and Trumpet Flourish, is forthcoming from Math Paper Press. Um, let's welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. So I write poetry. I'm going to read um, some poems for you tonight. The first poem, I think, um, will be an introduction about me, aside from what I said. Um, it will also show my fascination with, with forms. So this um, poem is written as an abecedarian. An abecedarian is written in such a way that, you know, the first um, letter of each line corresponds to A, B, C, and so on. Okay. Hometown. Apatu Bulbulala Kabiling. The familiar names of barrios rule of the tongue like a secret language. I was born in Camilo Oshas, near the town center, renamed after Balawan's dear illustrious son who became senator and translated into English our national anthem. Land of the morning, the sun rose above fields of rice during the rainy season, tobacco in summer. Grandfather's name was a golden ticket, one that guaranteed hospitality, front row seats at the plaza come fiesta time. Instead of fast food outlets, we took to Tres Hermanas for noodles, jukebox playing records from the 70s and 80s. A few kilometers away, the crags of South China Sea, waves licking the shores of Parawir, where we once owned a beach house. Much later, we left town 
My father invokes himself exile, never to come back until after he died, ashes in a marble urn. Our orbit remained around Palawan La Union, with gossip passed along the grapevine of how relatives bickered and quarreled over small town politics. What does it mean to return when in all those years of being elsewhere, our hometown stayed in our mind, the tug of memory holding us no matter the distance. Weeds overran my mother's garden while ungathered fruits fell from trees. Overripe and heavy, their sweet decay veiling the house we left empty. In another part of the world, the cold burrows in their bones and each night, you look at the map where X marks the spot. A satellite view of the streets you walked, the church you went to as a child. It is as though you still live in the time zone, sun wrenched at this hour, the pinnate leaves of Mimasa opening. Okay, so my next poem um, is part of my ongoing project, which is about the search for the divine in the everyday. Um, yeah, so this is called Hymnal. It's actually a sonnet sequence, and the the poem is unpunctuated. I wanted to mimic, you know, how people pray, pretend to be unfiltered. Um, so this is the poem, Hymnal. The God of all grace, the God who rumbles as thunder but also whispers as waves, the God who saves and does not save. Tell me if you can hear me too, or are you busy listening to the lament of others who perhaps need me more than I do? With my little ones, what I want to know is how do you weigh each question, each plea, each prayer mumble before sleep to consider it enough for an answer? I'll never know your silence, although I'll keep on asking and looking for your face and strain to hear your voice in every sound. And there is nothing but God I want, I need to know. If you are the creator, then I am what you created. Flesh, blood, and bone, hair sprouting from my groin. The itch I feel is that you, God. You are the bread, the riven body, risen Lord. Create the scab to cross my wound. Your hands can heal, and yet, and yet, you also let the body fail. You let the sea churn waves that topple homes. You flood the streets with endless rain, or else withhold the rain for many months. If you indeed are the creator, then why bring forth the serpent tongue? Why make the poison I decline? All these questions, mere footnotes in your book. Why cancer in my father's lungs? This morning, are you the bee in the garden, flitting from flower to flower, searching each fold of petal for a drop of nectar? Is that you, God, or maybe it is me, bee tracking tremors of color, flickering light, fast flying birds? You reveal yourself as iridescent wings, beating faster than fruit flies, floating over orchids with furry lips and stuck out tongues. You sting because you can because the world must ache its way to joy. Of course, you're more than just this waggling bee, but it might be what I am to you, a bee lost in the garden, God, bee that makes honey from what it can gather. The leaves are leaving the branches, a storm of locusts devours the field, somewhere a star collapses into a hole where no light can pass. I wonder why you unmake your bounty, God, why you undo what is. Sometimes I feel I'm filled with doubt why you exist at all, how random you are in your mighty works. You play with dice, you deal you're the cards, God, you're a gambler and you take the loss. Not that we have much of a choice, do we, but I, I leave it up to you with the hope you let fruits ripen before they fall, before the worm gnaws its way into the gourd. Oh God, forgive my human heart. Forgive my unbelief. Another day, another night, it must seem like a blink to you, a single breath blown to the sky. You must be patient, God, if you are still here from the very start. When you alone had sparked a flame, it's good for you to stay this long. Though are you waiting to end it all? 
When will it be? You count the days, you melt the ice, the burning lasts, another day. What happens next is up to you and you alone. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, forever and never. You must be patient to life each day, while here I wait for all the days to end. The very end, God, I wait for you to snuff the fire. Okay. I'm going to read another poem about, um, that's part of this project. Okay. So, the title is the first line of the poem. Filling a picture, I think of Augustine, whose words come to mind as water eases into glass. You must be emptied of that which you are full. And what are we, really, but the vessels where desire pours and pours and could not help overflowing? I'm riddled with wants, each day a constellation of errands and meals chores and tries the body can escape from. The saint knew it well, confessing to a life full of sin, pears stolen from an orchard when he had better ones at home. The point is not the fruit, not the picture. It's the way a hand plucked a globe from the branches, sweet with drug that called hunger, and how a palm is cupped to collect water gushing out of a cistern so that you may be filled with that of which you are empty, Augustine continues, the reverse side of a coin. By the window, a tremor in the sky announces rain about to fall, heavy as a burden of clouds, the promise of flood. Only for a moment do I stop to turn off the faucet, aware of the world's thirst for all that is given, all that it seeks. My next poem is actually part of, uh, I have another project. Um, I'm fascinated with, or maybe obsessed, with Jose Arizal, who is the Philippines um, national hero. And this is one of the poems um, about him. Manifest, there's an epigraph. On May 3, 1882, Jose Rizal boarded the SS Salvadora and headed to Europe for the first time. 1. A pair of steamer trunks with iron locks, filled with clothes to be used for years before you'd be able to go home. 2. In your pocket, a silver watch whose crown had to, had to be wound up each day. 3. Talismans weren't smooth, tarnished medallion inscribed in Latin, green quartz egg, Crocodile's tooth. Four, names that weigh heavy on the tongue, names that would remain unspoken for time to come. Five, sheaves of paper, a set of quills, India ink, the lengths we go to skirt around that which cannot be said. Six, memory and its many ruses, wavering, like the flicker of shadows cast by the ship on the water. Seven, a crucifix on the crook of your clavicle, pendant of what you struggle to believe in. Eight, series not yet seen, letters that have yet to be written, already vivid and pulsing in your mind. Nine, hands clasped and eyes looking ahead that seem to hold all the sea contains. Ten, the horizon shifting as you move along the world's edge never to be reached. Okay. Um, this one is an ecrastic poem, so it's a poem based on uh, a painting. Okay. So the title is La Parisienne. Because the truth could not be stated plainly, Juan Luna Paints her worn, looking and askew, as though the world had tired of her and she had nowhere else to go but be here on the canvas. Scarlet and ochre, a deep color of rust, fading gold. The scene suggests no joy in the realm of La Belle Epoque. Instead, 
a woman whose disquieting gaze dares you to look at her without flinching, her downturned lips on the edge of what might be a confession. What secret is hidden behind the folds of her dress? What story? He tells her to stay still, hold the pose. El trabajo no está terminado. Years later, he would aim a revolver and in a jealous rage, kill his wife and mother-in-law at their home in Paris. The French court would acquit him on grounds of temporary insanity. By then, his work would be finished, sold to the highest bidder. And the woman in the painting stares longingly, fumbling for words, help, pasecu, edemoi, s'il vous plaît, but no one is listening. I'll read some recent words. Okay. So this one is a poem that I actually wrote um, during the Singapore Poetry Writing Month, which is April. So in short, it's called Singapore Rhymo. Um, you can actually join the group on Facebook. Um, just, type, just search for Singapore Rhymo. So they give you a prompt um, every day and you know, you basically write a poem every day for 30 days. Okay, so the, the prompt for this poem was, uh, I forgot the prompt, but it's in the form of an anima methodi. It's a made up form. Um, yeah, they make things up in, in that Facebook group. <laughs> okay. You did not ask to be born, but admit that you still wanted it. Life, the world opening to an explosion of life, your amniotic mouth saying yes, your hunger a beacon for your mother's breast, the milk itself a form of yes, each drop becoming part of your flesh, your hummingbird heart, fontanelle, each part of you a yes, bones growing, fusing into a single yes, as lines form to make a poem, your skin conversing with someone's skin, tongue, a voice repeating yes, how else will you admit this one? This life you never asked for. What other choice did you have but to say yes? Language as explosion of what might be said as you open your lips and begin a breath with one syllable, yes. I'll probably read uh, one last poem, which is um, an ecrastic poem. So I do a lot of ecrasis. Uh, we might have seen this in the National Gallery, um, if, you, if you've been there. So this is the painting. Um, it's Georgette Chen's um, self-portrait. Okay, so she actually made two self-portraits that were displayed um, in the gallery, but this is the, the poem that the work is based on. Okay. After Georgette Chen's self-portrait. One day in your life will not be a day like any other. Life becomes a mirror reflecting your face, and for once you can see who you are. Your skin not as a mask, but as yourself. Your eyes meeting the gaze, not of your lovers, but your own. Your days dappling the canvas, each stroke of the brush exactly where it needs to be. The curl of your hair, your black chongsam, smooth as obsidian. You close your eyes and paint a portrait, the absence of sorrow, the sorrow of absence. One day, you will open a window. You will see your face before you were born. Uh, we have a lot of time for, for questions. Um, some of you wish to ask either Grace or Vigilance um, about their work. And should I start things off or yeah. Yeah, um, skip over the awkward silence <laughs> before the other questions come in? I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued by influence. Um, what influences these two writers? Um, um, what has influenced you 
at the start, what continues to influence you in the work that you do. Um, Grace, I'm really in awe with the way you handle the body in your work. Uh, the, it's very corporeal and cosmic at the same time, you know. Uh, and it, it's, it's interesting to think of the corporeal and the cosmos in your work when I listen to you and the, the grotesque. It's very grotesque, you know. I love it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, where that started. And with Rodrigo, you know, it's, if, if, if I think of graces in terms of the grotesque, it's, it's the Baroque when I think of you, um, your work, um, the, the prayers, um, but also like the kind of lush language that you love. Um, so I'm interested in, and maybe the student writers here would be interested in what has influenced you. Um,
Um, I know that it's, that there's this, um, it's quite popular now for people to write speculative fiction. I don't think I'll ever really be able to do that effectively well because I find that reality is quite grotesque in itself. I don't need to mm. um, write something about the imaginary um, you know, sci-fi because I find everyday living is quite torturous, mm. to be honest. Are you, are you working with the same, uh, are you grappling with the same concerns in your new book? As you mentioned, you have a yeah. book coming out. Okay. Yeah. Um, hopefully, if 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 all if the plans come through, um, I should have a new poetry book out by the Writers Festival. That's the aim. It's, it's already done. Uh, but with as, as as writers, we are never satisfied with our product. So I'm still hoping at the last minute that it will be just taken off my hands and that I will not meddle with it anymore. But um, hoping to have that. Uh, I just finished uh, completing a novel as well, um, and I, I must say my, my themes work in and out. Um, I, I'm born in Singapore, I'm Singaporean, but um, I've never really felt very um, much a person of, of, of the local. I, I, um, I, I feel global, and I feel local, and um, I, I feel that my home it's not really where I am. So even when I'm traveling and I'm coming back home, it's the same question that Robin was asked me, like, you know, so how do you feel coming back home? And it's very difficult to answer the question because um, I, I feel like a foreigner sometimes, even in my own body. So I don't know whether um, that is a, a sign of, of, of protesters that I, it somehow the, the, the alignment, I'm still finding a way to align everything neatly. I'm not a freak, but I mean, I don't know. Being human is freakish, right? In, in terms of influence, um, I mean, I do read um, contem contemporary poets, but um, I think the poet who has most influenced me would be Luisa Gloria. She's a Filipino American poet based in Virginia, but uh, she writes about different things, um, but her language is very rich, it's very lush, and I think she's taken into task, you know, one of the poet's essential task, which is to, you know, describe the everyday and make it, you know, sublime and extraordinary. Um, I think that's one of the most important lessons I've learned from her. Um, but I think I would like to mention, um, I mean, because you mentioned about you know, the baroqueness of it all. Um, I am Catholic, as most Filipinos are, and I think we tend to have a baroque imagination. Um, you know, we like our rituals, um, our singing. I'm part of a church choir, and some of my choir members are here. So, um, you know, I do tend to be influenced by by church hymns. I think in hymnal, I, I quoted or misquoted um, you know, some church songs. I think in the attempt to not really subvert, but you know, to try to see something in a different light. So you know, I think that comes into factor when I write. Um, Larry mentioned about influence. I'd like to ask about the process. Like when you come up with a poet or a poem, do you start with the meaning? Do you have this stream of consciousness <laughs> you like um, process? Or do you start with form or structure? Or do you start with um, the tonality of the words and how they come alive? As a text, so I'm just I'm just curious how how you started that. Yeah, so I agree. Yes. Uh, every, every act of writing is very sacred to me, um, but that means that I don't need to be sequestered in my room to write. So I could have this very intense sacred moment that say. Um, let's say you're taking public transport, or even, uh, you know, in the 
the office or having lunch. I've, I've written very intense good poems. Good for me, meaning that I'm very proud of them. So um, how to get into the process is there has to be, I believe in inspiration. I, I used to, I used to be quite uncertain about it. People would say like, yes, you know, when you read interviews of writers and they'll be like, yes, you need to be very disciplined and do it every day. That works actually more for prose. Now that I've done both genres, prose, I have to have dedicated time um, to write. So for me, what works best for me is mornings and possibly nighttime. Um, mornings meaning when, <coughs> when I'm sort of just awake and, my, and I'm still halfway in between worlds and I, I just open myself to this, this uh, very intense germination of feelings and, 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 and a memory or, or, or an idea and then I start with either an image or a one or two good lines and then I really just follow and I, I describe this as being like a medium um, I, I, I'm sort of like, in, at, at my most um, creative moments, I'm literally just a translator. Sometimes I'm very surprised what I write, and I really don't know where it came from. So the, the medium part of me is translating whatever this uh, cumulative influences, memories, good and bad, things that I've read, things that I've seen, things that I've heard, it just sort of um, ferments into this, this, this Muse inspiration thing, and I, I follow. And I would say that now I'm a better writer than I, than I, than I was 20 years ago because I have uh, absorbed more, let's say, travels, I have absorbed more life experiences, I've absorbed more readings, I've understood myself better. So the, the, the fact that I'm a vessel of, for, for, for my muse means that I am better equipped with more. Uh, things to say and more tools and more efficient way of writing than I was 20 years ago. So, um, same way of doing it, like when you say it's stream of consciousness, I can still do that. But I would say that my stream of consciousness now, because of my um, experience in writing, is same as writing, writing a bike or, or doing gym or doing martial arts. It's the, the fact that the, 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 the aspect of doing it so many times that the skill set has improved and I still don't, don't, don't really know how I got to do it. You don't really know how you know how to ride a bike. You just got used to it. It has become a habit as well as as well as some form of skill. You can't really explain it. How do you know how to swim? How do you teach a kid how to swim? It's hard to explain it, right? At that moment, it will just float and you just go. But before that, it's all the skills that you just have to learn it. So at that stage, the, the in-between amorphous stage, I cannot explain it. It, 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 is, it is quite a spiritual experience for me each time I write. Thank you, Grace. I think for me, um, the process, okay, I think it begins with an idea, otherwise I wouldn't be able to, to write. But I don't write from feelings. I think it's a very dangerous idea, at least for me, okay. um, because I do believe that a poem should have an idea in it. But I'm not so I think. Um, so when I write, I have something in mind. Maybe I have a destination or maybe I don't. And I have to figure out how to get there. Um, I'm similar to Grace in a way that I usually write in the morning. It's only because I think in the morning before I go to work, I don't really think about anything else and no one will be calling me or making any demands of me. So therefore, I have the space and time to, to write. Um, I think in terms of the writing discipline, I do agree it's a skill. And you know it's something that you should try to do regularly. If not every day, then you, know, you should hone your craft um, as regularly as possible. I think it helps if you have a project because if you tend to write every day, there will be a point when you'll ask yourself, oh, what am I going to write? And that will be you know, the cost for a writer's block. Whereas if you have a project, um, it will give you a stream of ideas you know, for you to write regularly. So you know, right now, I do have like, multiple ongoing projects, one of which, one of which is um, 
a poetry collection based on Noli Mitangere, which is a book by Jose Rizal, again, you know, one of my obsessions. Um, so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm writing a poem for every chapter of Noli Mitangere. So that's 60 something chapters. So you know, th that gives me enough, um, I guess, fuel to write until I think about the next project. I think that's important um, for you to, you know, apply your discipline on on something. Project or deadline? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, like if you know that you have published a book at some point, yeah, or, book, yeah. Sure. or if or if the journal is asking you to submit something by a certain deadline, you push yourself more. Deadlines are very, very powerful. Yeah, I like. <laughs> 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 deadlines. You wouldn't try it. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's time to approach these authors uh, during our uh, wine and cheese. Um, so please feel free to approach them if you have more questions, if you want them to read their poems again, um, or more of them. Uh, can we thank uh, Grace and Rodrigo for tonight?